this month, the Albert D. Tilly Leadership Institute is shedding light on leading women, women who are in leadership positions, women who are in STEM. And today we are joined none other than Dr. Haida Hackman. Um, and it is so, so incredible to have you here. I'm going to ask if you could as well, just tell us a little bit about who Dr. Hackman is, um, about your background, your story, and what you are currently doing. Okay, so my story, I think like many stories, I guess, um, it is told slightly differently every time, depending on the context and the mood and the, and the privilege of hindsight, of course. So when I reflect on my story from the position that I'm in now, which is um, having returned to South Africa um, six months ago after almost 30 years abroad, to be the interim director of Future Africa at the University of Pretoria. I think about that story as a journey of rather deep personal and professional exploration. And I say that because it really did take me a long time to find my voice and my place in the world, to know what it is that I wanted to do, where I wanted to be and where I wanted to go, how I could make meaning out of the conditions of privilege that I was lucky enough to grow up in, with access to education, parents and teachers who provided strong um, and patient role models, I should add. And so there were many stop-start moments along the way. I dropped out of university the first time round. I tried jobs that could have taken me in all sorts of divergent directions. I traveled a lot and slowly but surely through experimentation, um, which included some failed experiments, I should add, I started understanding where my passions lie, where my voice might be heard and what I would have to do to um, use it. And that came fairly late in life, but I think that was not a bad thing. Along the way, I think I learned to be open-minded, to not be afraid of change, new ideas, uh, new cultures, to be curious, and once you have found what it is that you love to do, which in my case was a passion for, for the ways in which science can and does shape the world around us, um, that it's a learning experience and that if you are patient and persistent, um, you find the red thread in the story. And it's brought me back to Africa, which, which makes me really happy. That's that's so lovely to hear. And you speak about science and your passion for science. And I mean, in the recent years, we've heard about all the movements of women in STEM, young girls in STEM, young girls in science, because for the longest time, it was a male dominated field. So as a woman in STEM, not just a woman in STEM, but a leading woman in STEM, do you feel as though you have had to overcome some challenges, you've had to overcompensate your qualifications, or you've been discriminated against in, in one way or the other? I think there have been challenges along the way. You know, remember that I have not, um, quite early on in my career, I left the strictly academic sector and went more into the science policy, science advice and science, international science management domain, um, which is, you know, to this day is still very male dominated. And yes, so I do feel that at times I had to really walk the extra mile. But I think that it's important also to share with young women who are interested in, in science um, that the boxes that we encounter are socially constructed boxes and they are in the process of being de deconstructed. There is real recognition and I think a growing understanding um, at all levels within our science systems, nationally, regionally, and globally, um, that we benefit from, from diversity and inclusivity. Our knowledge, trust benefits from that. Mm -hmm. And that, that means, you know, for women, there are new opportunities for young women. And so they need to be encouraged to jump in and help us deconstruct those boxes that have been challenging for people of my generation and earlier. The time is now and um, you can help make, help make a difference to mm -hmm. the science system. So I think that's a really exciting time. 
I agree with you. And I think what's just as exciting about it is that we are in a technological age that I don't think we were even prepared to be in. I think that we saw this age coming in at least 10 years from now. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had to catch up to date, which means that there are new skills and talents being you know, developed in real time, which, like you said, provides that opportunity for women to catch up yeah. because now, you know, when it comes to STEM and it comes to technology, we can learn at the same time. And I think that's very yeah. exciting. Um, I, I guess my next question would be, it's Women's Month. And I'm sure that being a, a woman in leadership, you probably get asked to do this probably at least once or twice um, every year, speak in Women's Month, say something in Women's Month. How do you feel about it? Um, because I mean, uh, yes, Women's Month is to be celebrated, but then it also always brings onto the surface all the other things that we're still struggling with. Um, the 2030 agenda goals say that we should have reached equality by 2030. I personally don't think that it's possible uh, and I'm really an optimistic person, but I'd love to hear your views. Yes, I mean, it's important to have goals, right? Um, Women's Month, for me, it's both. It's a month of awareness, which means we need to be aware of the women that we celebrate, the achievements that have been made, um, but it's also a month of being aware of the, the distance we still have to travel. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think both perspectives are important. And yes, one does get invited to do events and talks, and that's important. And I love to do that. But I do also feel that we've talked about this for a very long time and that we should in future really ensure that the events we organize around Women's Month are action-oriented events. We need to think about the outcomes. We need to think about talking about what works, what we've seen work in other sectors, in other institutions, in other countries, wherever, and learn from that. Um, so in some ways, I want to say, you know, at a personal level, it's also a month where I reflect on what am I going to do in the coming year? Mm -hmm. And that involves making pers a personal pledge. And I would challenge all women who are invited to interviews or to speaking events to think about their personal pledges. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's clear that at Future Africa, there is a real opportunity and possibly a need for women like myself and others on campus nationally to come together and really think about the mentorship arrangements that we could put in place. Um, I think a lot of us are involved in mentoring, but I think that can be scaled up if we work together. And so that's my personal pledge this year's Women's Month. Mm, that's an absolutely lovely pledge. I always say that there's something that we almost forget about, and that's the importance of representation. And representation uh, plays hand in hand with mentorship where, I mean, it's yes, you can go and do the groundwork, but also being there and being that representation for other girls, for other young women to see that it is possible plays as much as an important role as, you know, going outside and up in arms and doing other things. Now, as the Albert Lee TV Leadership Institute, I like to refer to us as the pinnacle of leadership. I, I can't let you go without asking what your leadership philosophy is um, and how you, you use that on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think for me and my, you know, if I reflect back on, on the leadership positions I've held, there are two things that go hand in hand and that I hook my um, strategy onto and the one is to really inspire inspire my colleagues my collaborators to think big to have big visions and to not be afraid of those mm. um, so really inspiring and that doesn't work unless you have the commitment to the second factor which is to enable so once you've inspired your colleagues once you've helped them to create a vision of what they want to achieve with a project or a program or their particular role in an organization. 
it's to make sure that you put in place the conditions of possibility for them to succeed. And if they don't succeed, to have their backs, to be there, to, to help them through the failure, to protect them, um, to correct them, um, but to nurture them towards achieving the inspirational visions that, that you've helped them to create for themselves. So inspiration and then enabling, that's my style. That is um, quite that is quite something. I must say a lot of leaders don't actually provide a platform for, you know, not for platform for failure, but provide a platform for people to try. And that if you do fail, it's not the end of the world. You tried, let's make it better and let's see how we can progress. I think that's really phenomenal. Um, and I hope that that's a takeaway that some people can take home as well. So as we bring this very short interview to a close, I guess my final question to you would be, what advice would you give young girls um, interested in either pursuing STEM fields or those who have just stepped into STEM fields? I think that message of the box, there are boxes. There are boxes that people will want to put you into, but those boxes are constructed. They're not real. Mm -hmm. And you can deconstruct them, mm -hmm. find the mentors, find the role models, see how they've done it and help us um, the older generation to really deconstruct those boxes. Remember that you matter more than you matter more than you think. Mm. Ah, and what words to leave that with? You matter more than you think. I love your analogy of the boxes and deconstructing the boxes. It reminds me of the glass ceiling. It is glass. It's not, you know, concrete. It can be broken. Um, so thank you so much for your words of wisdom, Dr. Hackman. It has been an absolute pleasure having a conversation with you. Thank you. Lovely to talk with you, Alma. Thank you.